Hi, I'm Rick Latham. In this video, we'll cover the concepts found in my book, Advanced Funk Studies. The patterns in the book are things that I've found over the years that have helped me become a better player, more consistent with a better time feel, a better groove on the drum set. Some of the patterns are just exercises, and some of them are actually grooves that you can use. I'll go through the book, starting out slowly with some basic patterns, then gradually we'll get a little more involved on how to use them around the drum set. Consistency on the drum set, making things really groove, timing, the way things line up are things that are really important. As a young drummer growing up, I listened to all kinds of music and was fortunate enough to play with some great R&B artists. From them, I developed an understanding of real rhythm and blues and funk playing. As I grew older and started playing more and more different styles of music, I became more aware of just how much of an effect this experience had on me. People were always commenting on how good my groove was, which is very important to all drummers. That's what we all strive for, to make everything feel good, really tight, solid, right on the money. The things I learned playing with these players were invaluable to me. As I grew older, I started listening to different players, Steve Gadd, David Garibaldi, Harvey Mason, and probably the funkiest drummer in the world, Bernard Purdy Purdy. These guys were the founding fathers, I think, of contemporary funk and linear style drumming. The exercises my, in my books evolved from my early exposure to these drummers. In this video, I'll be playing patterns in the book, then we'll every once in a while switch to a playing situation with my band so you can see how to use these concepts in a live situation. We'll begin with the introductory exercises. They're on page eight of the book for those of you who have it. Some of these exercises are quite simple and some are a little more complex, but they are all very useful. The main thing here is to make sure that the hands line up and that the feet and the hands line up. In the first section, we can play each exercise with the right hand on the hi-hat, left hand on the snare drum, or the reverse, left hand on the hi-hat, right hand on the snare drum. I suggest that you use a quarter note pulse to start these exercises, play them with a quarter note, and as you get a little more experience with the pattern, try using a samba bass drum pattern, dotted eight sixteenth, boom, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. I'll play the first exercise and show you exactly what I mean. Notice how the hands change. I'd like to say one thing about playing the hi-hat. You can play different accented and unaccented strokes, of course, but I find that you get a little more solid, a thicker sound using the shoulder of the stick. So I'll mostly play with this area of the stick, the shoulder of the stick. It's a very simple thing, but I want to state it up front because you'll notice throughout the exercises that I'll use different parts of the stick. This is very important, and I, I'll talk about it again as we go through the patterns. Now I'll demonstrate some more patterns.
After you get more familiar with the patterns, you should use the Samba dotted 8 16th bass drum pattern. This pattern makes a really great samba groove. You can play it a lot of different places on the set, a lot of different ways. And I'm going to use it a little bit. I'm just going to jam on that groove for a second so you can see what I mean. The next exercise utilizes the doubles. For those of you who aren't familiar with this notation, the slash through a stem indicates that you double that stroke. When I say double, I really mean double, not a bounce. This is a very important point. Uh, the first exercise is basically a paradiddle, but the, we're doubling the first stroke. The second exercise is a double paradiddle, doubling the first stroke. Notice how the doubles remain very even. As you go faster, remember to keep the doubles very open and keep them very clean. This will be very useful. The next exercise can be played two different ways, with an alternating sticking or with double strokes. But again, keep them very open, whichever way you decide to play it. This is something you'll hear throughout the video. It's very important. The next four exercises use doubles in a little different manner. You're playing triplets now, doubling the left or the right. I'll play them slowly and then a little faster. Again, notice I'm using the shoulder of the stick on the hi-hat to get a little fatter sound.
The next section deals with fixed hi-hat patterns, where the hi-hat plays quarter notes, eighth notes, the and of the beat, and sixteenth notes on the and a uh of the beat. One e and a, uh, two e and a, uh, three e and a, uh, four e and a. Uh. The hi-hat patterns stay the same while the snare drum accents change. We'll begin with the hi-hat playing quarter notes. Again, the important thing about these exercises is lining up the bass drum with the snare drum and hi-hat. These are very simple exercises, but I think you'll be surprised how much they can really help your playing. Again, these patterns are played with the quarter note bass drum and with the samba bass drum pattern. Again, the alignment is very important. Now I'll do the hi-hat eighth note exercises. Now the hi-hat offbeat exercises. These patterns sound very simple, but don't be fooled because the simple stuff sometimes is the most effective. And I'll show you how to use these a little bit later. Now the hi-hat 16th notes, playing the and uh of the beats.
Next are the hi-hat openings. In these patterns, it's very important to notice that as I close the hi-hat with the foot, I'm also striking it with the stick. If I'm playing an open, notice that I'm shifting the weight of my foot from the heel to the toe. Notice that I'm hitting the close with my foot and with my hand. This is the problem and the reason for these exercises. It's very important that the close hit happens exactly at the same time as the foot closing of the hi-hat. And you don't want to open the hi-hat too much. Try to keep the hi-hat where you just get a wash thing happening, where there's just a sizzle between the hi-hats. Notice that eighth note openings last an entire length of the eighth note count. Don't cheat the opening and don't close them early. The tendency is to close them early and it obscures the figure. It sounds sloppy, so make sure they line up. If it's an eighth note, make sure it lasts for an eighth count. If it's a sixteenth, make sure it's a sixteenth. Here's an example of some eighth note and sixteenth note openings. Now I'll play some examples using them in a four bar pattern. Three bars of time and one bar of the hi-hat pattern. Now I'll do a few of the fixed hi-hat patterns in four bar phrases. I'll play the pattern by itself a couple of times and then I'll demonstrate it as the fourth bar in a four bar phrase. Three bars of time, one bar of the pattern. So you can see how these sound different from the normal basic rock groove. It kind of breaks it up a little bit. They're just putting the hi-hat and snare drum on different parts of the beat. They start off very simple and they get more and more complex as we move through the book. For an even more challenging exercise, try going back and playing the hi-hat quarter note exercises with the left hand playing quarter notes on the snare drum and the right hand playing quarter notes on the hi-hat as written and play the snare drum part with the bass drum. I'll demonstrate this. I think you get the idea. These are great for lining up the hands.
Next are the combination patterns. These patterns are made up of combinations of the patterns we've just covered. Again, these exercises should be practiced separately, but should also be incorporated into a four-bar phrase with three bars of time in front. I'll demonstrate some combination exercises. You can see that these start making a little more sense when used in a musical context. Now we'll talk about the linear concept. The linear concept is where nothing is actually hitting at the same time, like in your basic rock grooves where a, a lot of times things hit together, the right hand with the right foot or the left hand with the right hand. You're still playing 16th note groupings, but each one of the 16th notes is placed on a different surface of the set. It gives a really nice feeling. It makes things really move along, a nice loping feeling. I'll play a few exercises of this linear idea.
Next we'll get into some fill patterns. Each one of these patterns has its own special purpose. Again, timing is very important, as well as the relationship between the hands and the bass drum. I'll play each one of these a few times by itself, and then I'll use it in a four bar context. In the first exercise, it's important to keep the flams very open. Let's talk for a second about bass drum technique. There are two techniques for playing a bass drum. One with the heel down, pivoting with the ankle, keeping the heel down on the back of the pedal. The other technique which I use is playing with the heel up on the ball of the foot. You're not really playing with the toe. That's a mistake a lot of guys make. They're pushing too much with the toe. It's actually the ball of your foot where you can really push down and get some weight and power on the pedal. You're also using your leg quite a bit, the weight of your leg plus the stroke of your ankle. I'm sure a lot of you have heard some stories about several famous drummers such as Buddy Rich, Steve Gadd, and Louis Belson that also studied dance. I, as a child, also took tap dancing lessons. I'm not telling everybody to go out and study tap, but I think it's a great thing that I got from that, the motion in my foot. Uh, I use kind of a reverse shuffle pattern. By shuffle pattern, I'm speaking of the tap shuffle, where one is a glance and then a tap. The initial stroke is with the ankle and the follow through is with the leg. I'm not actually moving on the pedal, but the weight distribution is the same. It's light, then heavy. Now I'll play an exercise and show you what I mean. This leads to another thing, sort of one of my key phrases. You can create the illusion of speed by playing something cleaner. Everything is in its proper place. You don't have to play stuff that fast to make it sound fast. It sounds faster because the beats are very clean and they're moving closer together. The cleaner the strokes are, the faster and smoother it's going to sound. It sounds like there's a lot of stuff happening, but it's just basic 16th notes. Notice that when my hands move around the set, they stay on the same plane. They're staying flat and not moving like this around the set, but like this. It's very important that your grip be together to be able to execute these exercises. The next exercise is another exercise using, using doubles, but we're using them on the tom-toms. They're more difficult to play on the tom-toms than they are on the snare drum, so you have to learn to really adjust to the different surfaces you're playing. Another key phrase. Notice that you have to really pull the doubles out of the toms. I'll play the exercise a couple of times on the snare drum, then I'll play it on the floor tom. When I wrote this next example, I was thinking of it like a Rademacue. 
But as the years went by and I tried to explain it to people, I found that uh, it was a little easier to think of it as six equal strokes, like a six tuplet. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll demonstrate it as six equal strokes and then play it in a triplet pulse. This also works great playing this pattern around the tom-toms. That's a very deceptive pattern. Uh, it sounds like there's a, a lot more going on, but it's just six tuplet. The next fill pattern is a typical kind of rock triplet thing, but I play it a little differently. I play the bass drum in the middle. You can play it with the bass drum starting the triplet or ending the triplet, but I'll show you why I play it in the middle. I think it has a nicer sound to it, and also it works out a little better in a groove context. If you're playing it as a fill, the right hand is just playing eighth notes, and the triplet is built around that. I'll play it as written, and then I'll play it in a groove context. The next exercise also uses doubles. The right is playing the first two strokes of a triplet figure against a quarter note pulse, like this. You can also use this in a jazz or swing context. Next are the funk patterns. This is what I like to think of as the real meat of the book. This section contains a lot of different styles of patterns. They're mostly based on concepts that we've already studied. A lot of them are just broken up 16th notes played very cleanly around the drum set. You'll notice when I play these how clean they sound. The feel is there and the accents are very important, so watch the accents very carefully. It's also a good idea to sing patterns so you know what they're supposed to sound like before you play them. Now I'll play some of these funk patterns. As before, I'll play the pattern by itself, and then I'll use it in a groove context. <laughs> 